Welcome to our Hofstra University virtual Zoom event. I'm Rob Leonard, and I'm going to be talking about forensic linguistics. Whenever we deal with crime, unfortunately, uh, there are a lot of distressing, violent, and often gruesome details of crimes. And I just wanted to warn people of that. When I worked with the FBI Behavioral Analysis Unit 1 uh, at Quantico uh, at, to do training of their folks and uh, other agents worldwide, um, Jim Fitzgerald, who had uh, recruited me down there to uh, help him teach these week-long forensic linguistic boot camps, had this as his mantra, language can solve and prevent crimes. And as we went around and trained other people, we always brought this up. Language evidence is something that is still being overlooked, but just about every time we do a presentation, someone would come and say, you know, it never occurred to us uh, at the scene of the murder, there was a letter that didn't seem to be in place. And then can you look at it? Very interesting thing about language is that every time any of us open our mouths or sit down at a keyboard, we can be revealing a lot more than we're aware that we are revealing. For example, where you're from, where you've lived, how old you are, etc. In case after case, we've been able to wring remarkable amounts of intelligence from seemingly minor linguistic details. And we'll see a couple of cases where this is what happens. Embedded in your language and your history, there are clues as to what your nationality, your occupation, your education, where you've lived, as I say, what movies you've seen, um, and skilled persons can sometimes find that information. I'll show you a case. These are typical assignments for forensic linguists. So linguistic demographic profiling, and we'll talk about the Unabomber in a minute. Authorship analysis and the um, worksheet that we sent before the, the session has the Hummert case letters, and then the spray paint on a wall here is from the Coleman triple homicides. And discourse analysis and analyzing ambiguous phrases and underlining meaning. And this is a case of uh, Tanya Christensen, a University of Copenhagen professor uh, with whom I work and uh, who teaches um, with me here every fall. We'll talk about that too later. These are some of the criminal, domestic, foreign, counterterrorism cases that we have dealt with just in the past couple of years. I am lucky to be involved with a number of organizations here at Hofstra. We have the graduate program in linguistics, forensic linguistics. We also have a joint master's and juris doctor program with the Hofstra Law School. We have a five year bachelor's and master's in linguistics, forensic linguistics. And we have our Institute for Forensic Linguistics, Threat Assessment and Strategic Analysis and our capital offense or death penalty innocence project with Hofstra Law School. And I'll be talking about that more. I also have a consulting firm and uh, I and some others have just started uh, what we're calling Flint, a high tech 
artificial intelligence startup trying to code and create an engine that actually does what experienced forensic linguists do. Forensic linguistics more and more is being admitted and has been admitted in court cases of murder, death threats, forgery, fraud, corporate espionage, all of these, because all of these deal with language and language evidence. And if you think about it, what in the, in the law is not language. Even a forensic chemist is going to have to testify through English here in the United States or in another language. Oh, I wanted to mention before uh, that I'm really happy to have questions, but I think we should hold them to the end, but write them now and put them on uh, in the chat and uh, as they occur to you. So I was talking about being admitted uh, to testify in court. And in the United States, there are two rules, uh, the Daubert and Fry, uh, which, by which judges are charged to be the gatekeepers of scientific evidence, of expert evidence, doesn't have to be scientific per se. And uh, these are some of my uh, background items that uh, judges use to weigh whether or not to allow me to testify. And I've been fortunate because we have uh, I have been admitted in 12 different state courts uh, several times and six federal district courts. And I've also testified for national tribunals. And I've consulted to criminal, civil, counterterrorism agencies uh, all over the United States, Canada, England, uh, the United Kingdom, uh, Europe, Latin America, and Asia. Uh, for clients, including the FBI, the Joint Terrorism Task Force, and the Prime Minister of Canada. So the idea of forensic linguistics as a useful tool uh, is growing. Here is an example that is, uh, demonstrates what my mentor and the founder of Forensic Linguistics in the United States, named Roger Shai, S-H-U-Y, uh, used to help in the kidnapping of a child. This is a famous example, uh, at least among forensic linguists, and since uh, uh, we're not as well known as, say, fingerprint people, it's probably not that widely known. So take a look at this ransom note. You see some things, of course, right off the bat. And here are some linguistic investigative features. This is a non-exhaustive list, but just some of the things that linguists look at when they're trying to understand who might have written something. The most important thing here in a forensic context is uh, beware of disinformation. Unless somebody is going to sign his or her name to the uh, threatening letter or to the ransom note and say where they live, uh, we have to immediately assume that there are going to be other disinformation items in there as well. So a common one, of course, is dumbing down. It's a lot easier to dumb down than it is to what I jokingly call dumbing up. Uh, and we've seen in countless cases where people try to dumb down. What happens though is that they don't dumb down all systems of language the same amount. And when things don't match, so here, take a look at this now.
So what do we see here? Of course, we see all sorts of anomalous stuff. We see trash can misspelled. We see cops misspelled. We see devil strip, whatever that means. Um, so we generate hypotheses. So trash can, okay, it's a K for the cuss sound. Cops, K for the cuss sound. So maybe this person is not a native English speaker and whatever uh, uh, language the person has is the native language. You always use a K for the cuss sound. But then we have Carlson. Okay, maybe he or she looked up uh, or knows the street name is actually spelled with a C. But then we have cash. Then we have uh, come alone. So it's an irregularity, it's anomalous. If somebody really always spells it with a K, then they should always spell it with a K. And then there are other things wrong. So for example, daughter is misspelled, as well as cops and can, but precious in the first line is spelled correctly. And as a matter of fact, this isn't how ransom notes usually are. Usually it's send the money, leave the money, or the person dies. But here, this use of precious really bespeaks a native English speaker with a good command of the language, or at least someone with a good command of the language, because it's a turning of the knife into the hearts of the parents, your precious little girl. And indeed, we have this devil strip thing too. Now, Roger, well, all of us usually, it takes us a while to figure these things out, but Roger almost immediately said to the authorities, do you have on your suspect list a well-educated man from Akron, Ohio? And I always like to think that the police said, come on, Roger, stop joking. Uh, how could you know that? And so quickly, um, uh, you know, did, did he, does he walk with a limp? You know, Sherlock Holmes always says, the man who wrote this walks with a limp has a frayed left sleeve and was in the British Army in India. And Roger said, just look at your suspect list. And the answer was that they did have someone who was a well-educated man from Akron, Ohio, and he turned out to be the person. Now, how did Roger know all this, okay? Well, we've just seen all these poorly done dumbing down. And also the word devil strip is used for this patch or line of grass, but it is used only in Akron, Ohio and surroundings. And how does one know this? Well, if one is Roger Leonard, uh, Roger Leonard, if one is Roger Shy, people often call him Robert Shy for some reason, so I guess I just did the same thing myself. Um, now, if you have a word for this strip of grass, as I did growing up, you probably figured that that's the word that everybody in the world has. Because when do you ever talk about this strip of grass? The way I know uh, my term in this area that I was brought up in is because my father was a county official. And here it's called the county strip. And it was the part of the lawn that I hated to mow because it had all these trees on it. And he was always saying, you didn't mow the county strip. So I grew up assuming that everywhere in the world it was called the county strip. But now I found that it's called some other things. And this was a very good bit of evidence for Roger because it was not the thing that somebody knows people have a lot of different words for and therefore might try to disinform by using a word that was not from his or her region. What other features show the mistakes to be disinformation and dumbing down. So take a look now that we've seen all these other things. What else? I'll give you a hint. The punctuation. The punctuation is perfect and hardly in keeping with someone who doesn't know how to spell cops. So what forensic linguists do is we maximize the intelligence yield from this linguistic evidence. Texts, reports, wills. I've had a number of cases where wills were changed just before the person died and who benefited from the will changed mightily. 
and very often fraud examiners and others know that there's something wrong about the communications, but they can't put their finger on it because they have their own toolkit and we have our toolkit. And in one, I was able to show that the person who had changed this lady's will was not the lady at all, but her relatively new husband. And uh, he had redirected virtually all her considerable wealth to his children from an earlier marriage and away from her children from an earlier marriage. So let's do some more linguistic demographic profiling. Everybody knows that in Spanish, you put an inverted question mark, quieres ir? And this is so different that it's very unlikely a Spanish speaker writing in English would do it. Matter of fact, if you see it in English, you probably uh, should think that it is a, uh, uh, a disinformation, somebody trying to frame a Spanish speaker. But there are other more subtle differences than this inverted question mark. Capitalization is different in Spanish and other languages than English. So you say, you write el español, es una lengua bonita, and the español is not capitalized. And that's an easy sort of subtle thing for somebody to carry over into writing English. So in one case we saw, I'm always watching when she goes to French class, was this evidence of something, or maybe it was just a, a typographical error or somebody uh, was too lazy to uh, hit the shift bar. But it merits further looking at. Now in a real threat case, a stalking threat case, we have this. I challenge that you have the right to have her to yourself. I have known her since a very long time myself, perhaps even longer than you. And there was something in here that just wasn't something. I must have read it 30 times. I didn't know what was wrong with it. My colleague and mentor from Columbia, Dr. Benji Wald said, ah, since then I realized. English says things like, I've known her since 2013, but we don't say since a very long time in English. But there are languages that do, for example, French. Was this a translation of depuis longtemps? Was there a French speaker? Yes, there were, there was. And his exemplars match several other language patterns in the threat as well. And we were in a big hurry on this case because we wanted to make sure no one got hurt. And this was a very, very valuable pointer to a specific subject very quickly. Roger did demographic profiling for the FBI when the Unabomber's manifesto came to light. And an old uh, sketch of the Unabomber was uh, one of the many thoughts that they had over this endless uh, investigation was that perhaps it was a younger person, somebody who looked like this was at one of the bombing scenes. And of course he doesn't look anything like Kaczynski because Kaczynski wasn't there. So Roger said, the Unabomber is not, as many thought, a poorly educated young man but was actually in his 50s, highly educated with an advanced degree. And the degree was not in the humanities. The Unabomber, Roger continued, had lived in, but he was not from the American West. And he had been raised in Chicago in the American Midwest and he'd been raised a Catholic. And this he learned from reading the way the Unabomber used language in the manifesto. The Unabomber seemed to misspell words, but they weren't really misspelled. He was matching spelling reforms, which was attempted by the newspaper Chicago Tribune during the 40s and 50s. And Roger reasoned that a literate and intelligent Chicago area schoolboy coming up at that point 
might well adopt some of these spellings and his own, as his own. And that was one good reason that he was from Chicago and in his 50s, and that was true. He also said rearing children instead of raising children, which at that point was a Northern Cities feature. So several things pointed to Chicago, and indeed he was from there. Also, he used Sierra. Uh, as a topographical term, he said he went out to the Sierra, into the Sierra, or he went out to uh, meditate or something like that. But he didn't use any other Western U.S. terms, such as ranch, fork, range, mesa. And Roger reasoned that he was therefore not a native Westerner, but he was one who had moved to the West. And indeed, he had been. And here is the rearing children, as I said. Also, the Unabomber used 1960s terms, playing footsie, working stiff, etc. He used sociological terms that said that he had a very good, uh, very intensive, probably uh, undergraduate education, David Reisman's terms, and on like that. And Roger was right on all counts that he got from the linguistic evidence. Here's another case of both profiling at first and then authorship. And this is the case of Charlene Hummer. Now we've been talking about profiling. What can we tell about the person who might have written something? And then we also have authorship at the end of that. So profiling and authorship are on this continuum. We keep narrowing down the suspect pool. And then authorship analysis says who is the more likely person to have written this. Now, this is the worksheet that we sent to you folks. And remember our forensic linguistic investigative features. And also remember, and to be aware of disinformation. So I'm going to put this up on the uh, video, but also uh, if you have it, there's a good time to open up that handout. So this is the first letter that was found on her husband's windshield. Then considerably later, she was murdered. And as the investigation heated up, this letter was sent to the police and the press. So take a look now at what we sent. And I'm going to stop share so I can read some of your questions. So these two letters seem very different. There is a ton of information in this letter. It's very wordy. There's no overt uh, mistakes. I mean, there's a couple of typos, but whereas this is clearly scrawled 
reminiscent of the ransom note that we just saw in the prior case. And the police asked me, as they had asked Roger in the kidnapping case, what can you tell us about whoever wrote these documents? So since it took Benji, Wald, and me a few weeks, uh, I'll give you guys another five minutes or so. And of course, even though I didn't know anything really about the case at that point, I suspected that the police might suspect that they were written by the same person. But look how different they are. So after reading this around 9 million times, I realized there was a connection. I mean, there were obvious connections. It's written in English, okay. Uh, there's no misspellings. Clearly, there are funny things going on with this. For example, the capital Fs for no good reason. But even then I knew, and this was one of my first cases, that that's the kind of easy thing that people might change to try to have people not think it's their writings. So I call this masking as opposed to masquerading, which is when you make believe you're somebody else, which happens, of course, very often as well. So here we have a couple of dumbing downs. Cops have no idea how easy it is to pin husband when they only look there. Uh, but he uses uh, uh, determiners and uh, prepositions quite well uh, earlier on in the letter. Now, people are, are uh, pointing out very good things. Uh, for example, are there compound sentences? Are there non-compound sentences? But again, the, uh, the object of this is to get a judge to allow the police to use other written evidence to make their case. And you need a search warrant for that. And you need a good cause for that. So finally, I noticed not only, oh, I beg your pardon, I forgot. This second document, if we want to assume that it is written by the first person or even not, is what the FBI calls a POMIC. Jim Fitzgerald invented the term. And it stands for post-defense manipulation of investigation communication, otherwise known as a red herring communication intended to divert suspicion. I killed him. I killed her, not her husband, which is pretty good evidence according to several uh, uh, homicide detectives, when I would use this in training, they say, well, oh, gee, I wonder who did it then. All right. So here we have this again. But now we have a lot of similarities. And we also have what we called ironic repetition. A couple of days, uh, I would have loved to have found out a couple of days later, she made sure my fiance found out. She wanted to break it off. So I broke her neck. This was obviously a rhetorical device, and it turned out to be a rare rhetorical device. See, the rarer something is, the more idiosyncratic it is, the harder it is to explain away if you find it in two supposedly unrelated documents, except as coming from a single author.
and that's the object of authorship analysis. How likely is it that two or however many documents share an author, have common authorship? And I went through Greek professors, Latin professors, all the way to the BYU Encyclopedia of Rhetoric, and they said it was rare enough so that they had no specific label for it. So the judge granted us the search warrant. And we got other writings from the chief suspect who unfortunately was, as it so often is, the husband of the murdered woman. When we got all that, we noticed, Benji noticed, and it took us a long time to notice this, there was a total skewing of contractions in all of Hummert's workplace and prison writings and in the two anonymous letters, which we call the Q, negatives were sometimes contracted, but positives were never contracted. So did not, sometimes became didn't, but I am what was always I am, never I'm. I will was always I will instead of I'll. And these are some of the slides that I walked the jury through. But remember, there were many other similarities. There were the fact that both of these letters had very, very skillful narrative manipulation and was so skillful, flash forwards, flashbacks, stepping aside, that you didn't even know it was happening. And that bespeaks a real skill. And that skill was in both of those letters. And now we find this pattern that not only links the letters, but it links to Hummert's writings. I am, it is, I will, we are, but don't. And we looked at Google, although I wouldn't use Google for um, relative uh, frequency anymore, um, but this is one of the first cases that I was using any corpus. Um, but we see here in the known writings, we have 74 non-contracted verbs and zero contracted. And in the question documents, the two letters, we have 23 and zero positive contractions. Now that's quite a skewing, quite an idiosyncrasy. Um, and we wondered what about in other, uh, by other users, so the mass of Google, of course, we don't find it. And interestingly, in Google Scholar, which is, of course, scholarly uh, papers, I discovered to my surprise that there are almost no negative contractions. Look at the tiny number there in the negative contractions in Google Scholar. So to make a long story short, it was not that everybody does that, and I just never noticed it before, or even that everybody in York, Pennsylvania did it. Uh, and I never noticed it before. Now, these analyses compare competing hypotheses. That's how I was taught at Columbia Science progresses on. We try to explain the non-random distribution of the data by constructing competing hypotheses and testing, examining to see which better explains that non-randomness. But forensic linguistics cannot say John Smith wrote something. It just keeps shrinking the suspect pool. This is actually quite analogous to what the people at the Human Genome Project tell me that DNA uh, evidence does as well. They keep excluding people. So this is a very important thing to realize I certainly never identify a particular person as having read something, uh, written something, but I do, and others of course do, we look at the patterns in the Q and the patterns in the K. And Hummert was not just on the linguistic evidence, convicted of murder and sentenced to Life without parole. Um, several years ago, I got a call from a prisoner in the Chicago area who said that he had been convicted 
largely on the basis of linguistic evidence, and he'd been directed to me as possibly someone who could examine this evidence. So my interns and I, and now this has grown to be the capital case death penalty um, innocence project at Hofstra. We have now done a number of these cases, but I'll tell you about the QB case in a moment. So my recent graduate and a PhD candidate at um, Aston, Julianne Ford, teaches the internship with me. And we work with our constitutional law professor, Eric Friedman, and when necessary, his interns. Uh, and in analyzing the evidence and appeal possibilities in capital cases where language evidence, typically recorded conversation, interrogation, or in the case I'm about to tell you about a confession, played a crucial role. We also work on other serious crimes for both defense and investigators sometimes. Uh, cold case murders, uh, we've done several of. And recently we helped uh, track and charge a serial killer in the American South. Um, uh, someone was killing her husbands, uh, making it look like a suicide according to the police. And we were able, after a many months study of everyone's uh, writings to conclude that the superior hypothesis was that she had, or I should say that the uh, patterns in her writings were the best explanation for the patterns in one of the husband's uh, suicide notes. So now Antoine Cuby is the man that got me involved in this. So in 1996, accused of murder and armed robbery. From various pieces of evidence, the most important one and the only one uh, that has not, uh, well, it's a long story, but anyway, here is the confession and here's Cuby's signature. The only problem is that none of the, well, I shouldn't say none, but the patterns of language in this confession do not match QBs, <laughs> but they do match the detective who testified against him. QB maintains he was interrogated and beaten and beaten and beaten. And unfortunately, the Chicago police were infamous during that period of time. There were many court cases for torturing um, defendants. Finally, he was told, okay, you want a phone call, sign these forms. He signed the two pieces of paper and the next time he saw them, there was a confession typed over his signature. So the authorship of the alleged confession is questioned. So my interns, we didn't have the death penalty innocence project yet, but we were working on other cases and I analyzed so the competing hypotheses here were the patterns of the Q documents, better explained as being instances of which patterns of QB's known writings or other than that. For example, the language of the police officer who testified against him. And on various measures, and I'll just zip through these, we found these features in the confession do not appear in QB's known writings and certain of them do appear in the speech patterns of the officer and in the general register or genre that other people uh, described as police writings. So complementizer deletion and for non-linguists, I, I just I won't go into it, but uh, linguists can see uh, the pattern uh, matched the, did not match QB. Um, contraction patterns, the patterns did not match QB, even though the, uh, we would expect more contractions in uh, verbal rather than written. And the police said that QB had dictated it to them, but we find the exact opposite pattern. 
discourse markers, not a convincing match. And then uh, comparing the confession to the language of the police officer, approximately, they have QB saying. Now, it's very, very common, of course, for police to take a confession and help the person get exactly what they want to say. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as there's no coercion and everything else. But the police here maintain that was not what happened. They did not say that any single word was written by them or suggested by them. They said they testified each and every word that QB spoke was what was in that confession. Yet we find approximately and at an unknown time. And then we also have an interesting syntactic structure, which is the placement of then. Typically we'll say something like, we ate dinner, then we went home. We typically don't say we ate dinner, we then went home, we could. But it's not canonical, it's not the most normal in, in most uh, sentences. And what we find, and I'll summarize for you, is that QB has the more normal, then he shut up, then I said, then the little guy inside, but the officer has the, all three then went, he then walked. And what do we find in the confession? I then told, we both then went. So what is the possibility of this 18 year old guy because he's giving a confession to murder all of a sudden using a syntactic structure that we have no evidence that he ever used before. Matter of fact, he barely uses the term then. So we see, of course, an absence of the number of matching links between the Q and QB's K and a presence between the Q and the K of the testifying author. So this supports QB's contention. He was not the author of the confession that brought him a life sentence. But he had exhausted all his normal appeals. Then the state of Illinois passed a law that said if you were tortured during that period of time, uh, you had more appeals. And this is a 2016 letter and they were very interested in the analysis of the confession as well. And QB called me last week and said that things are going fairly well and on track. Uh, so now he has been in jail since 1996. And uh, a good six years ago, we showed that how highly unlikely it was that he had written his own confession. Okay, now here is a phrase of my uh, partner in not crime, Tammy Gales, uh, fabulous corpus linguist and forensic linguist and theoretical linguist. Uh, who runs the program here with me. No one knows they need a linguist, but everyone needs a linguist. And I thought it might be interesting, especially because I'm so proud of my graduates, where have Hofstra Forensic Linguistics graduate gotten jobs? Huh. And somebody forgot to spell linguistics correctly. Well, that was me. Um, okay, private intelligence agencies, law firms, teaching, freelance, FBI, CIA, NCIS, you name it and students also go on to PhD programs in the US and abroad. I'm gonna end with uh, a bomb threat case that shows sometimes patterns, you're looking for patterns and you're looking in the wrong places. Schemas, uh, well, uh, linguist knows what, what schemas are, narratives or, or, or uh, knowledge structures through which we understand the way the world works can be limiting. So in Beverly Hills, a house started to receive bomb threats. Here's one of them, we'll see it again. Here's another one. Here's another one. Ah, Jodie Foster said I. Now many people might remember that Jodie Foster uh, a man tried to kill uh, President Reagan because he said, I'm in love with Jodie Foster, an actor, and she doesn't know I'm alive, and now she'll know I'm alive. So here are the three bomb threats. Now, without going into the way the BAU-1 analyzes threatening communications, 
we don't have personalization here, but we have repeated threats. Uh, well, anyway, I'll just stick to this very case. So the owner of this house, a very rich person, wasn't even there. Uh, his head of security, um, you guys may or may not know that many very rich persons have their own police forces uh, for good reason. And they said, well, we are out of our, uh, our element here. We just don't know what to make of this. So they went to another group, a private intelligence agency composed of uh, ex-CIA agents, and somebody had seen me speak. So uh, they asked me if I would help, and I said, of course. So first thing I ask, by the way, in all cases like this is, have you told the police? Because I want you to tell the police. We have to have everybody possible involved. And they said, yes, they had, okay. So I'm driving back and forth to Hofstra, and uh, they're telling me what's on these uh, notes. And then another note comes another day, and they read it to me. And they say, look at this capital B in bomb. Yes, okay. But I mean, it's just like with the Hummert letter. So we saw maybe a certain kind of sentence structure, but what do we do then? Who do we say wrote this? I mean, there's too many people in the world who might capitalize both the Bs in bomb, and we don't know who they are anyway. So what you try to do in a case like this is you try to get something that is outside the four corners of the letter in the real world. And that was why I was very interested in the fact that we had Jody Foster. So what else in here is linked to something in the real world? Okay. Well, this house clearly. Okay. But that's the house that's receiving the threats. Um, gas bomb perhaps. So I said, Hmm, gas bomb. Only gas bomb incident I know off the top of my head is the sarin uh, subway attack in Tokyo. I said, look, uh, have the police look at the BAU's CTAD, the Communicated Threat Assessment Database, which the Behavioral Analysis Unit maintains. Jim Fitzgerald began it and I worked on it. Um, go through the police to the local FBI field office. You have to do it through channels and they will request the BAU. Look in there over 4,000 threats and other criminally oriented communications for the term gas bomb. We may find that John Smith just got out of jail in Pittsburgh and he had been put into jail for gas bombs or at least threatening with gas bombs. And they said, sorry, we can't do that. I said, what are you talking about? We're talking about a bombing here. What do you mean you can't do it? And they said, our police don't talk to the FBI. I said, what? What is this, some bad late night TV show where the local cops are, are against the FBI? This could be the clue that you want. You keep on telling me, what do we have in these letters? And that's what we have. Now, we also have other things, right? As I'm sure you've noticed, the uh, writing goes uh, up and down instead of sideways, except for Jody Foster. And then we have some other odd things. Now, I notice things just like I did with the narrative because of the languages that I've studied and my specialty language is Swahili and East African Bantu language. I took Swahili in college because out of 65 or 55, I don't remember anymore, languages taught at Columbia was the only one that wasn't taught five days a week. And I was in a uh, performing group and I couldn't have classes Monday or Friday. And yet that was what happened in college those days. So there was one that wasn't taught Monday through Friday, and that was Swahili. And as I love telling my Swahili students, I've taught it now on university level for decades. The day I walked into Swahili class, the first day, I could not have even found Africa on a map. That's how much I knew about Swahili or Africa. But I fell madly in love with it. It has 15 genders. The, what would be a gender if it was uh, a uh, romance language? obviously not having to do with uh, sexual gender, but neither is it in la mesa, but le table. Why is it a, a table feminine in Spanish and masculine in French? It's just a way of keeping track of things. So three of those uh, genders have to do with different aspects of space and time in Swahili. I mean, uh, it's a linguist dream. So I fell madly in love with it. I wound up taking it, uh, specializing it in graduate school. Then I got a Fulbright fellowship for one year to Kenya and I stayed there seven. So 
one of the things that I wrote about was Swahili demonstratives. The other thing I wrote about was Swahili narratives, which really helped me in the Hummer case because Swahili has very interesting, different set of uh, tenses that you use when you have narrative sequences. So I see those things, and that's why I immediately saw in Hummert that the narrative sequence was being handled so brilliantly. And here, I had to pay a lot of attention to demonstratives. So here we have this house, this house, this house. We also have here, this house, what? So I kept wondering, what is this? What am I missing? There must be something that is being communicated here that I'm just not getting. Finally, I said, perhaps it's because I'm making an assumption. I am viewing these as letters. What if they're not letters? What if they're poetry? What if they're something else? And on a whim, I looked up. Well, before I get to that, as I said, one time I talked to the uh, Yale Sherlock Holmes Society. You can imagine how much fun that was, it was great. And Sherlock will always say things like this. He'll, he'll look at these and he says, aha, yes, there's a, to be a bomb, but not at this house, not at the house that's receiving the threats, but at Studio City shopping area on Ventura Boulevard. Clearly, right? How do we know that? Well, I said, what if this isn't a letter, but if it's a map? Now, here is A, Jody Forster's house, which I did not get from my intelligence friends, but I found on, the web, on a website. And here, uh, anonymized a little bit, is the house that was receiving the threats. Then I took the Jody Foster threat and superimposed it on this. And there we are, Jody Foster over at A, this house down by B, and a gas bomb at Studio City. And no one could ever have been more surprised than I when that worked. And I sized it, but of course I didn't move anything around in terms of relative space. So I immediately called these guys up. And at that very moment, the letter writer was recognized by somebody's chief of security as a previous stalker. And he said, oh, that's so-and-so. We knew him from this other city. This is exactly the kind of letter that he sent or something. And he was picked up and he never talked. He never told anybody what the letters meant, why they were a map or were not a map, never gave any information at all. And luckily, no bomb went off at Studio City. So to recap, we try to help non-linguists gain maximum intelligence from language evidence. And if people are interested, in addition to all our BA, MA, MA, MAJD, we also offer intensive one-week courses, which when Jim Fitzgerald retired from the FBI, we moved his week-long boot camps that he had invented and developed to Hofstra. And in the spring, he teaches one with me and uh, very heavily oriented on threat assessment and FBI procedure. And Tanya Christensen from the University of Copenhagen, uh, who, with whom I've worked many cases now, she and I teach the one in the fall, which is more internationally oriented in European cases and is also more generally uh, introductory to forensic linguistics. So I, I hope this has been of interest to you all. I'm going to look at chats now, and I thank you for attending.
people can apply for the masters still beginning in uh the fall we still have a couple of spots um i don't know about online courses it's a very complicated um question because the quote unquote distance learning courses must adhere to uh strict formats um but if you are interested please email forensic linguistics at hofstra.edu and my unbelievably good uh, graduate fellows and our admissions people and I will um, answer any other questions about um, courses and like that. People are very kind. So yes, you can find Jody Foster on Google. As I say, I like to uh, say, you know, I called up British intelligence and they told me where she lived, but yeah, you can find, you know, where all the stars houses are. So I'm very happy that people found this interesting. Yes, will be a bomb versus going to a bomb. Notice that too, of course, but again, it didn't help us know who was sending the, the bomb. This is great. And I see a lot of old friends here. I'm happy to see you all. And I'm glad you all seem to uh, be interested. And if you have cases that you think we might be interested in helping with, um, please let us know. As I say, forensic linguistics at hopstra.edu. And the this presentation will be cleaned up and edited and posted on the Hofstra YouTube channel, uh, I believe within a few days. Why is there a difference between the three bomb letters? Boy, you got me. Uh, that was a very uh, puzzling uh, set. It did, of course, look like they were all sent from the same person. And talking about how many international students are accepted for the master's studies, that's all, uh, uh, admissions knows all the details of that. We have no uh, restrictions ourselves. Um, as uh, the person asking me said, maybe there are travel restrictions. And of course, uh, I would need a crystal ball to know just what's gonna happen uh, from there. Hi, Hannah. Hi, Sandy. It's very good. I see a lot of old friends here. It's very, very nice. I have done a lot of work on 911. <clears throat> um, and uh, I was on a uh, nightline talking about it. Uh, a little girl disappeared in Colorado and the father was giggling when he was reporting her missing and um and he said oh and i called her mom and i told her to get her butt over here <laughs> and little girl wasn't found uh, a screen had been taken down from her room and as you can imagine everybody really piled on to the dad because he didn't fit their expectation of what a father should sound like with 911. But I said, you cannot tell how people are going to react to stress. And they had an FBI agent on who also said the exact same thing. And as a matter of fact, um, one of the cases that I used to illustrate it was I'd have the book here, but I can't put my hand on it now in this moment, um, was Marty Tankleff, who at age 17, came downstairs uh, first day of senior class in high school to find his parents bludgeoned to death in pools of blood. And he called up 911 and it was used against him in the trial in which he was falsely convicted, spent 17 or 18 years in jail until he was fully exonerated. 
um, because he was too calm and in his 911 call. So absolutely cannot tell from that. And also there's a, a new show called um, Reasonable Doubt, uh, uh, which looks at, um, looks at old cases and they had me on to talk about a 911 case. Uh, so that should come out whenever <clears throat> Reasonable Doubt does again. Yeah, there's a lot of work that needs to be done on 911 calls. <clears throat> yes, Sandy. Sandy Disner writes, thanks for doing this. Wish we had the publicists that other corners of forensic science do. Lawyers have been heard to say, I wish I knew about forensic linguistics X years ago. Yes, that's exactly why Tammy says, nobody needs a linguist, but everybody needs a linguist. Yeah, so people uh, ask very reasonable questions about, uh, do we use software? Yes. Uh, to cut to the chase, we are trying to develop software that does what Tanya and Jim and Benji and Tammy and uh, Dakota Wing and uh, Julianne Ford and I do. And there's a lot of really good software out there, computational linguists, uh, have it, but it, it's, it's a long story, but so far there's a mismatch. Obviously we can't have programs do exactly what we do because there are so many variables. Um, but that's why we're developing the Flint engine, which we are trying to use AI to encode that which we actually do. In other words, not merely by AI black boxes and things, uh, nothing against AI black boxes, I suppose, but um, that, that's a, a whole other conversation. Um, for ineffective assistance of counsel. Uh, how long has this information been known? Well, um, Roger Shai wrote uh, a book in 97, uh, which is uh, a seminal book. And in it, he recounted uh, many cases that he had already worked on. So if it had occurred to somebody uh, to look around for a forensic linguist, uh, it, the expertise would have been there for quite a while now. Yes, Jenny, uh, it's a good point. Uh, one of my colleagues at Columbia at uh, Hofstra writes, I don't believe a computer would have come up with the idea of a map. Uh, that's a really, really good example of what computers don't do. They can't take all, you have to tell a computer what to do. And when you realize how many infinities of variables we're always taking into account. And also how little information is encoded in words. Much of it is in our own minds and we read into it. And again, that's a schema and Gricean maxims. That's a whole other conversation. Yeah, and we've worked with a lot of mitigation specialists, uh, death penalty mit specialists. Um, and if you have cases, uh, please reach out to Eric Friedman, uh, the professor of constitutional law. And he is uh, the conduit and the vet, the person who can vet uh, cases. And, and on, because he understands uh, what postures of cases mean. I mean, uh, unfortunately, if I had known him uh, to work with, I knew him, but uh, when I got the QB case, I probably would have told QB that there was nothing to do because he had supposedly uh, used up all his, uh, his appeals and he had, but then the law changed. Um, yes, I worked on the later part of the John Bonet Ramsey case. Uh, and that's again, a very, very long story.
I would refer people to Jim Fitzgerald's opinions on the John Monet Ramsey case. What a what a sad case. Huh. Sandy so Disner says, I talked about Roger Shire's kidnapping case in class, and a student informed me it had been on CSI the week before. Bet they didn't give Roger any royalties. Well, I'll let him know. That's pretty good. Of course, he did publish it in, uh, in uh, dialects. Um, I work on speaker identification. I'm not a phonetician. If you're interested in a fabulous phonetician, who works on speaker identification, I'll look up Sandra Disner at USC. Um, however, I've worked on a, a number of cases because uh, the phoneticians and uh, uh, audio engineers that I've worked with in the past knew that it was useful to have somebody who could be able to describe dialectal variation. Uh, last case I worked on like that, the two people who were accused of being the same person spoke such different dialects demonstrably that it was very hard to believe they were the same person. Um, again, that's a whole other conversation. Um, book and reading uh, recommendations, uh, take a look at our website and our FAQ uh, because there's a whole bunch of really excellent books. Most of them Roger Shies. Roger's written about 30 books now. Um, on many cases, um, you know, the language of bribery cases, of perjury cases, of defamation cases, uh, language of murder cases, which he dedicated to me, so I'm very happy for that. Um, uh, Malcolm Coulthard, uh, <clears throat> Johnson's book is excellent. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> Speaking of crime, uh, it's going to come out in a new edition soon, and that will be great, too. Very good, guys. I'm, I'm going hoarse, so I will sign off now, but I so appreciate uh, all these excellent comments and questions. And I wish I could go through them all individually and at great length. And maybe some at some future point, we will be able to. OK, I'm going to leave now. Bye, everybody. Thanks for coming.